All right, good morning once again. If you would open your Bible to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 30. We've made it to the second to last chapter of this book, 1 Samuel 30. And this morning we're going to be in verses 1 to 6. So just the first six verses. The title of the sermon this morning is Strengthening Ourselves in the Lord Our God. So let's read the text, I'll open us in a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into the sermon this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 30, beginning in verse 1, if you'll follow along in your copy of God's Word. Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire, and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Let's pray. God, as we come to a story this morning that is as tragic as any in the Bible, God, help us to have eyes to see not um, the trial as ultimate, but help us to see you as ultimate, God. God, when we are at our weakest, our lowest moment in life, please, God, we pray that you would help us to come to you to find strength and to believe by faith that not only Can we find strength? But we will, that you will graciously give us strength in the moment when we need it. Guard us, God, from going to the things of this world to find strength or to find comfort. Move us, God. Keep us in your fold to to come to you as David does and to strengthen ourselves in the Lord our God. Help us to see that this morning, God, as we work through this text. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, This morning, uh, the story we're at, uh, it's kind of a new section, but it's tied to the previous section. Uh, So let me give the context so that everybody kind of knows where we're at and and what's going on right now when all this is happening. So Saul is the king of Israel. King Saul has been trying to kill David, who is the newly anointed king, but hasn't taken over power yet. But God has protected David over and over again in his life. But in a moment of weakness... David believes that it's just a matter of time before Saul finds him and kills him. And so he flees to Philistia, thinking that that was the only way he could escape Saul. Achish, the king of Philistia, agrees to give David the city of Ziklag. David tells Achish that while he's there, he's been carrying out raids against Israel and their allies. But that's not the truth. He lied to him. David stays in Philistia there for 16 months. But Achish decides to go to war one day with Israel, and he tells David that David and his men are going to be fighting with them. This forced David to either come clean and risk his life or to fight his own people. So David's in a conundrum. But but God in his providence provides David with a third option. The Philistine commanders are suspicious of David and don't want him fighting with them. As a result, Achish tells David to go back home, to go home to Ziklag in the morning. And that's what he does. And we're going to see that God's providence to keep David from the battle had more than one purpose, as he usually does. So let's look at our text. I'll give exposition this morning, and then I'll give application from the text. 1 Samuel 30, beginning in verse 1. Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, 
The Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire. Now we saw last week that Achish had ordered David and his men to return to the land of Philistia, to, to, which is Ziklag, which is under Philistine control right now. They set out early in the morning and the Philistine army went to Jezreel to go fight Israel. It takes David and his men three days to make it back to Ziklag. And when they get back to Ziklag, they're in for a rude awakening. While David and his men were away at battle, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev. The Negev is a Hebrew word for wilderness. And against Ziklag. Now we remember the Amalekites, don't we? Back in 1 Samuel 15, 2, God had told Saul, now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. The Amalekites were known to be a people who traveled from region to region, making raids on local towns. And that's what they do here. That's what they do to Ziklag. They overcome it. Why? Because all the men are at battle. There's no men to defend Ziklag. And they burn the city with fire. Now, we're not told why they do this, but most likely it was a retaliation for David making raids against the Amalekites. That's what David had done. It's probably revenge for that. Let's look at verse 2. And taking captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great, they killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. Now, not only did they burn the city, but they also kidnapped all the women. ESV has small and great, but that most likely means young and old, meaning they kidnapped young women, old women. These women would either become their slaves or be sold into slavery. Either way, they would be slaves. Notice God's protection here. They killed no one but carried them off and went their way. Now, one could ask the question, why did God allow this kidnapping to happen? And that would be a fair question to ask. But an equally fair question to ask would be this. Why did God not allow anyone to be killed? We can get hung up on 2A, all the women are taken captive, or we can be humbled by 2B, they killed no one. Let's look at verse 3 to 4. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with them raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. Now, as I mentioned at the end of the sermon last week, imagine if David and his men had gone off to battle against the Israelites. That battle would have taken weeks, perhaps months. What would have happened in those weeks and those months? God in his providence brought David and his men back to Ziklag at this moment. He brought them back so they could see the devastation. Their city is burned, presumably their house as well. Their wives are kidnapped. Their daughters are kidnapped. And their sons are kidnapped. We learned in this verse. So it appears it wasn't just the women they took. They took all the women and children, both small, both young and old. This is a Job-like experience. In a single day, Job lost everything he had except his wife, who was not a very wise woman. And in a single day, these 600 men lost everything they had. They lost everything. Keep in mind, you're like, no, they didn't. They didn't kill anybody. They don't have the story in front of them. We have the luxury of reading verse 2. They don't have a verse 2 in front of them. They have no idea if their wives and children are dead or alive. And so as a result, David and his men begin weeping. They are audibly and understandably weeping. They weep until they have no more strength to weep. You ever been there? I know that some of you have. This is the kind of weeping that you do not wish upon anybody. Verse 5 to 6a. 
David's two wives also have been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because all the people were bitter and soul, each for his sons and daughters. Now, David is not immune from this suffering. He doesn't escape it. His two wives are also taken captive. You have to wonder, what was Abigail thinking at this moment? Sure, Nabal was a fool, but it certainly beats getting kidnapped. David was greatly distressed. One of my application points a few weeks ago was this. Godliness is not measured by our distress levels, but our distress responses. When Saul conjured up Samuel from the dead, Saul told him, I am in great distress. So was David. Saul's in distress. David is in distress. Saul is understandably in distress. David is understandably distressed. His city is burned. His wives are kidnapped. His men's wives and daughters and sons are kidnapped. Now, you have to put yourself in these shoes, all right? I mean, imagine right now, like we leave church and if your kids weren't here, your spouse wasn't here, you went home and your house is burned to the ground and your, your family is completely missing and everybody's house is burned to the ground. And as far as you know, that's it. They're dead. And yet it gets worse. Can it get any worse than that? It gets worse. To add insult to injury, David's men want to stone him. Now, why do they want to stone him? Well, their families and kid their families are kidnapped, and they need somebody to blame. It was David's plan, after all, to go to Philistia. This is your fault, David. You led us here. David joins a list of leaders whom God's people were ready to stone. When Moses brought the people into the desert and they had no water to drink, they grumbled and they quarreled with Moses. They accused him of trying to kill them. And Moses said to the Lord, what shall I do with this people, Lord? They are almost ready to stone me. Exodus 17, 4. When Joshua and Caleb gave a good report of the land and said, God will be with us. We don't have to fear the people. Imagine, like, what's wrong with that? That's a good thing. Guys, we can win this. God will be with us. We don't have to fear them. He will give us victory. Then on the congregation said, stone them. They wanted to stone them. Even Jesus, when he said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And the religious leaders picked up stones to stone him. David now joins a prestigious list of God's leaders who almost got stoned. Now, at this point, I want us to pause and consider what David has gone through. Saul has thrown a spear at him multiple times to kill him. He has lost his best friend, Jonathan. He has been driven from his home, his wife, and his life. He has been on the run, hiding for several years. He has resorted to trusting the Philistines, but even they reject him. And now his city and his home have been burned to the ground. His wives have been kidnapped. His men's wives and sons and daughters have been kidnapped. Oh, and the cherry on top, his own men want to stone him. This is about as low as it gets. Not as low as Job, but pretty close. And the question is, how is David going to respond? Is he going to sink down into depression? Is he going to run away from his problems? Will he become paralyzed by fear and anxiety? Or will he attempt to drink away his problems? Or will he start blaming God? 
How is David going to respond to a crisis like this? Verse 6b. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. I love this statement. I love it because it's a miracle. This is a miracle. Nobody responds this way apart from the miracle of God. Now, two questions arise from this statement. One, who did the strengthening, David or God? You'll see two different translations. ESV has, but David strengthened himself, suggesting David did it. The NIV has, but God, but David found strength, suggesting God did it. So was it David or was it God? Both. We see the same paradox in Philippians 2.12, where Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. Who is working out our salvation? Is it us or is it God? Both. God not only provides the strength itself, he also provides the ability, the desire, the willingness for David to strengthen himself. But David must strengthen himself. God is not going to download strength to him. There are no downloads with God. God is not going to give him strength apart from David going to him. They are both true. Number two, what does it mean that David strengthened himself in the Lord his God? What does that mean? What exactly did he do? Right? Like, like, like that, that's kind of the question we all want to know. What, what, is, what does this look like? Well, going back to the possible alternatives that I gave just a minute ago of what David might do. What does it mean that David strengthened himself in the Lord? It means sinking down into God's character rather than our depression. It means running to God rather than running to Tarshish. It means planting roots of trust rather than be choked by thorns of anxiety. It means drinking from the well of the Holy Spirit rather than intoxicating spirits. It means trusting God rather than blaming God. David does the one thing that will help him. He goes to his God. We'll stop there with the exposition. Application. I have seven truths that God showed me in this text. I hope that you have many more. Number one, first truth comes from Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Now, I want you to consider that David is in Jezreel, And all he can see is an impending battle between him and Israel. All he can see is that he fled to Philistia to get away from Saul. Now he's got to meet Saul face to face on the battlefield. All he can see is the Philistine commander's rejection of him. And now he's got this long 60 to 75 mile journey home. David has been rejected by his own king, Saul, and now he's been rejected by the Philistine lords. That's all David can see. But the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. David can't see what's going on in Ziklag, but God can. God does. David returning home at this moment is a reminder to all of us that when life doesn't make sense, when things don't turn out the way that you wanted them to turn out, we can't see the full picture. 
We can't see what's going on in Ziklag. But God can. God does. God sees everything, everywhere, past, present, and future in one snapshot. Which means we can trust Him. I was talking with Lauren at lunch this week, and I said, they had, you know, they had to travel 60 to 75 miles to get home. And they did it over three days, which means they were booking. It's like 20 to 25 miles a day. It's like a marathon, three, a three-day marathon, three days of marathons. I imagine they were exhausted. I imagine when they got home, they were looking forward to their wife's embrace, their kids' laughter, a hot meal, and the comfort of their own bed. But they were in for a tragic surprise when they got home. Can you imagine how surprised they were when they got home to discover that their city is burned and their families are gone? But you know who wasn't surprised? God. God sent them back for this reason. When you are in Jezreel and all you can see is rejection, God sees what's going on in Ziklag. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Which means you can trust God with what doesn't make any sense to you. Two, God's so-called harsh commands are not so harsh when we consider the harshness of sin. God's so-called harsh commands are not so harsh when we consider the harshness of sin. God commanded Saul in 1 Samuel 15, Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Now, when we read that, that command seems harsh, doesn't it? Maybe even unnecessary. I mean, why do you got to kill the, the babies? The, the little lambs, it's, it's so cute. Why, why we got to kill this thing? It seems unnecessary. You know who thought it was too? Saul. He spared the best of the animals. He spared King Agag. Now we might read such a harsh command and think, was it really necessary to kill all of them? Seems kind of harsh. You know what else is harsh? Burning down a city and kidnapping all the women and children. God says in his word, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk. Or in other words, put to death all sin in your life. And we often are tempted, like Saul, to keep some of it alive. We spare the best parts of our sin, the parts we enjoy the most. And perhaps someone comes to us and challenges us to put it to death. And in that moment, we might think, hmm, that seems a little rigid. That seems kind of conservative, old-fashioned. That, that seems kind of harsh. You want me to do what? That, that seems kind of harsh. You want me to put this to death? But God's so-called harsh commands are not so harsh when we consider the harshness of sin. The Amalekites were brutal. Sin is brutal. Sin comes into our life like an Amalekite raid and it sets our passions on fire. 
It comes into our life and it kidnaps our joy and it sells it for a fleeting pleasure. God's commands, his harsh commands are not harsh. Sin is harsh. Put it to death. Put all of it to death. Three. God is in control of evil, even in the midst of kidnapping of women and children. God is in control of evil, even in the midst of kidnapping of women and children. The narrator says they killed no one. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, David and his men, they don't have the luxury of having a narrator. They don't know this. The Amalekites did not leave a sign on a wooden post in Ziklag saying, we, uh, to Israel, we kidnapped your wives and children, but don't worry, we haven't killed any of them. That night must have been the longest night of their life. How do you go on in a moment like this? How do you press on in a moment like this? By recognizing that God is in control of evil, even in the midst of kidnapping of women and children. The fact that not one single person was killed is the providence of God. We see all throughout the scriptures that God ordains evil to happen, but he is perfectly and completely control of it at all times. God let Sarah be taken into Abimelech's harem. But God said, I did not let you touch her. God let Samson be taken captive to the Philistines and his eyes gouged out. But God used him as a Trojan horse to bring down the Philistines. God let Satan afflict Job, but God said, you may not take his life. God ordained for Jesus to be crucified, but he did not let Jesus be thrown off a cliff when they tried to throw him off a cliff. And he did not let him be stoned when they tried to stone him. God is in control of dictators, tornadoes, COVID, famine, persecution, earthquakes, cancer, crime. He's in control of all of it. Now listen, it's one thing. You're like, yeah, yeah, man, thank you very much. God is sovereign. I know that. It is one thing to know that. It is quite another to be controlled by it. Do not make the mistake of thinking that you know God is sovereign. It's the same as being controlled by the reality that God is sovereign. We are either controlled by our fear of evil or by a fear of a God who controls evil. Those are the only two options. Four. God takes away our strength that we may feel our weakness. God takes away our strength that we may feel our weakness. David and his men, they were strong fighters. We see from all the raids they made against the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. And when Achish told David, he said, look, understand that you and your men, you're going to go out with me in the army. David, he didn't quite respond with humility. He said, very well, you shall know what your servant can do. Achish is so pleased with David, he says, very well, I'll make you my bodyguard for life. So David felt his strength. He felt the respect and the loyalty of his 600 men who would follow him into battle. He felt the honor and respect of a Philistine king who would make him his personal bodyguard. I mean, you must be a really good fighter if your enemy makes you his bodyguard. But God brings David off the mountaintop of strength and brings him down into the valley of weakness. When David returns to Ziklag, he no longer feels strong. God has so devastated him and his men that they wept until they had no more strength to weep. The warrior shepherd who took down Goliath is now bereft of strength. And if he thought it couldn't get any worse, it does. 
His own men speak of stoning him. Now, why did God allow this to happen? God takes away our strength that we may feel our weakness. I have to believe there is a connection between verse 4 and verse 6, where in verse 4 it says they wept until they had no more strength to weep. And in verse 6, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. God wanted David to feel his weakness. He wants us to feel our weakness. Why? Because when we feel strong, God feels weak. But when we feel weak, we feel the strength of God. Five. King David cannot alleviate our distress, debt, and bitterness. Only King Jesus can. King David cannot alleviate our distress, debt, and bitterness. Only King Jesus can. David's army is now 600 men, but remember it started off as 400 men. And remember the 400 men who first joined him? They all came to him with problems. First Samuel 22 too. everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was bitter in soul, they gathered to him. Now, if they were gathering to David because they thought that David was going to be their Messiah, they were mistaken. If they gathered to David because they thought that David could alleviate their distress, they were mistaken. They're distressed right now. If they gathered to David because they thought that he could rescue them from their debt, what's so bad about debt? Because they probably might have to potentially sell their wives and their children into slavery. If that's why they were gathering to David, they were mistaken. Their wives and children are now sold into slavery. If they gathered to David because they thought that he could alleviate their bitterness and soul, they were mistaken because they are now bitter and soul. King David cannot alleviate their suffering. Only King Jesus can alleviate our suffering. I so often find that people, Christians often, are looking to a spouse or children or a career or even a church to alleviate their bitterness of soul. You won't find it. Only Jesus can alleviate your bitterness of soul. If you are distressed, if you are anxious, if you are in debt, if you are bitter, if you are angry, and you are looking to even good things like a spouse, if you think, or if you're married and you're like, let's have a kid, that'll make it better. No, it won't. If I get married, I'll be happy. No, you won't. If you are looking to these to alleviate whatever you're going through, you won't find it. Only Jesus can alleviate your distress and your bitterness. Number six, not one stone will be thrown from the ground apart from your father. Not one stone will be thrown from the ground apart from your father. Jesus said, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Now, taking that truth and making it applicable to David's situation, not one stone will be thrown from the ground apart from your father. What's interesting is that the narrator doesn't say that David is greatly distressed because his wives were kidnapped. Now, I'm... Or that his city was burned. But because his men spoke of stoning him. Now, I'm sure he was because his wives were kidnapped and his city was burned. But that's not why he was in great distress. Even with Job. Remember Job, after losing all his possessions, his house, his ten children, his, his health, it gets worse. It gets worse. His wife throws a blasphemous stone at him and tells him to curse God. 
His three friends throw condemning stones at him and tell him, you must have sinned. And David is now on the precipice of being stoned, not metaphorically, but literally. But not one stone will be thrown from the ground apart from your father. We all know that God sometimes takes a bad situation, like a really bad situation, and he makes it worse. David was being hunted down like a dog, and in a moment of weakness, he ran away to Philistia. But then God takes that worse situation, and he makes it catastrophic. David has lost his home, his city, his wives, and his men's wives and children. But then God takes a catastrophic situation and he makes it downright unbearable. His own men want to stone him. But make no mistake, not one sparrow will fall to the ground apart from your father. And not one stone will be thrown from the ground apart from your father. Friend, God will not let a single atom touch you apart from his say-so. Seven. When you have lost, last point, when you have lost your army, your nation, your king, your home, your city, your family, your own men, your God is all you have. When you have lost your army, your nation, your king, your home, your city, your family, even your own men, your God is all you have. David at this moment has lost everything. He's lost everything. So where does he turn? To whom does he turn? Not to his king. His king wants to kill him. Not to his pseudo king. He's off fighting a battle. Not to his parents. They're hiding out in Moab. Not to his wives. They're taken captive. And not to his men because they're ready to stone him. So where can he turn? To his God. To his God. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David did not only strengthen himself in the Lord. There is a difference. Notice the way it's worded here. He's not just strengthening himself in the Lord like some conceptual, like go to church and you get a good sermon and talk to a few people. And I went home and I, yeah, I feel really strong. That's strengthening yourself in the Lord. David is strengthening himself in the Lord. His, his God. God is his. Friend, do you know God like this? Have you tasted Jesus like this? Where you are at rock bottom. You are at the bottom of the barrel. You have hit rock bottom and rock bottom is the rock of ages. Jesus Christ. Sometimes these are the most intimate moments of your life. This right here, this might have been the most intimate moment of David's life. You have no emotions left, no strength left, no energy left, and God meets you in your weakest hour. And he strengthens you. He strengthens you. Do you know God like that? Is he yours 
personal to you. It's Jesus, yours, like that. I pray that he is. God will meet you at your lowest point, at your weakest hour, and he will strengthen you. Let's pray.